I'ma get it, you know I be on the way yeah. You know I be on the way Man on a mission, I'ma get it, you know I be on the way yeah. So hard, ain't no Project for the Foundation, 501C3, non-profit, dedicated to aiding our nation's first responders. Our vision and mission is to enhance the life-saving capabilities of our first responders through raising awareness and funding for the life-saving work that they do. Our goal with the podcast is to be an educational avenue and a method for our heroes to express themselves. In the podcast, we will discuss various tough subjects. Some of the subjects may be uncomfortable or controversial. Our guests have a right to share their thoughts and ideas and for our listeners to hear the unedited words of our guests. The Foundation's role is to showcase a diverse array of thoughts and opinions within the first responder community. If you hear something that you do not agree with, please consider reaching out to us at projecttributefoundation at gmail.com and join our podcast. If you're a first responder and you would like to share your story, we truly would love to hear from you and learn from your experience. Please enjoy this week's show, and as always, like, comment, and share to help us grow. You can find more information at www.projecttribute.com. Thanks and have a great one. Welcome back to part two of Jared and Brett's discussion for last week. We're going to have them pick right back up. Man on a mission, I'm a kid, and you know I be on the way. Yeah. What was the question? Uh, so something not to ask you. Okay. So I think that I'm, I'm going to be kind of blunt on this one. I think that you'd be an idiot to ask somebody what their worst call is and really bring that kind of thing to the forefront of somebody's mind who might be having a good day. That is an absolutely God awful question to ask somebody. I mean, same thing about asking somebody if they've shot and killed anybody. Um, I mean, just those, one. Those yeah. dumb questions. I'm like, why the fuck would you ask that? Now, for me, again, I'm not going to be bothered by it. I'm probably not going to answer you because it's none of your business, right? But you might make up some story that is funny or whatever. You know, I, I might I just be like, response. I'm not going to answer that question. Have a nice day. But yeah. I mean, but like, um, but. Honestly, I am, I'm going to be polite. <laughs> I, I hope everybody else would be because ultimately if you're going to ask somebody what their worst call was, if they've ever killed somebody, if, you know, any of those, those types of really brutal questions that you, that you're, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say this right now. It is not easy to, to kill somebody. I'm going to say that without experience. Okay. Yes, I have not killed anybody. Okay. So yeah, I'm not the foremost expert on it, but I have common sense. My common sense states that, you know what? There is a reason that the average person with an, yeah, granted there's the state's got to investigate it when an officer has an involved officer involved shooting, but there's a reason that the it's people get like a 30, 30 day admin leave on average. Yeah when they kill somebody that shit's not easy. Well, that, it's not because they've done something wrong. It's because yeah. there's a debriefing period. There's mm -hmm. a mental aspect about that, that yeah. you want to make, I mean, it's, it's yeah. Like yeah. you said, that's Absolutely. not. And so, so, so to bring that up to somebody when they, when they're not currently dealing with a, a legit trauma like that, hey, I'm not one to throw that word around very often, but like, that's a trauma in anybody's life. I don't care if it really affected you that bad or not. That's still a fucking trauma. You had to fucking kill somebody. Holy shit. That's not easy. You, and, and ultimately, if you had to do that, you probably almost died yourself or were in a situation where you could have died if you didn't act the way you did. Right. Um, God bless. I hope that's the case because if you're not in a life or death situation, it's probably murder. Um, <laughs> I mean, and I'll tell you, I mean, like, and I've talked about this before. I mean, the reason I don't want to answer my worst call is because, I mean, I'll tell you what it is. It, I had to pick up car seats off of a highway, and mm -hmm. there were kids in that car, in those car, all, all three of the car seats that I picked up off the highway. There were kids in it to begin with, 
So you can just assume how that ended. But do mm-hmm. you think I want to talk about that? And I mean, yeah. as soon as I tell that to somebody, I mean, you know, the eyes get big and they're like, oh, fuck, what did I just do? What, yeah. what, what box like, did I just open? Before you ask. <laughs> like, but I mean, there are other people, though, that they'll answer anything they want. But yeah. and, and that's what I was saying. It's like, personally. I can do that. I can. Uh, the question is, how am I feeling that day? Because if right. I'm already mad and you ask me a question like that, I'm probably going to yes. tell you you're an idiot. Yes. Um, if I am not mad and I'm in a good mood, you know, maybe I'll sit down and I'll talk with you about what kind of things that we go through. Because yes. I'll tell you what, my fr- my 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 best friend almost died from fentanyl um, exposure. I, was I mean, <laughs> yeah, that was a fucking terrible day. That was uh, I was stressful. I was I was more panicked than his wife, but she was cool, calm, and collected. I'm sitting here like you need to get to the hospital, <laughs> like, but like that, you know, that's just one of them. I almost got shot in the face. I had to I pulled the gun out of the per- person's hand who almost shot me in the face. He had a bad grip on the gun. I'm lucky. I should be dead right now for a number of reasons, but that's one of them. Like <laughs> I I have I have been in a pursuit that ended in a shooting. Um, I, I mean, fuck, I mean, I can go, I can go on. Um, I've tased numerous people. I have fought people and, and I'm not some super cop. I'm just like every other cop. They've all gone through the same stuff. You know, there's so many life or death incidences that you deal with in this job. So yeah, it's, it's just one of those like, man, you're, you're talking to somebody about some of the worst things they've ever gone through is be careful how you approach something like that. Be a, be a really good friend before you start talking about that stuff. Because a lot of us are willing to talk about that kind of thing with somebody we care about. It's the people that have no business asking us that kind of question. Or even like, I mean, total, we're talking about Joe blow off the street. Stranger just wants to say something to you. Say thanks and move on. Like, and here's the other thing also, because I'll tell you what, there's, there's, there's two angles I'm going to take on this. You mentioned the the parking lot. So I'm going to go over the parking lot. Sometimes we're running radar and we're busy. I have had people show up and I, God, I did not want to talk to them. I didn't want to talk to anybody. And they pull up and they want to talk to me. I'm like, man, I am trying to focus on work. And now I can't focus on that because I have to make sure that you're not going to do something to me. Because of who I am, right? Am I a cop yeah. and you're, a tar- you're am, am, I, am I your target and you're just trying to play nice so you can find a moment when I'm caught off guard? These are things I have to think about now. So if you're going to talk to a cop who's out and about, you might get it go in front, not in front of the car where we're facing, but like out where we can see you ahead of us. Make yourself visible. Yeah. You know, keep your hands visible to us. Maybe wave at us and everything. We walk up like this. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like you know, don't put your hands in your pockets and start walking up to my car. I'm like, do you have a gun in your pocket? I or you yeah. know. So uh, you're just happy to see me. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it. No. But you know, just just cautiously approach. Say what you want to say and move on. But like. Um, and, and, you know, cop may wait, wave you over. He may get out of his car. Um, I would say that if it's going to be an officer safety thing, I'd get out of my car. Um, cause I don't want you, you know, ha- I don't want you to have the advantage of being right here where I'm like just hoping that something doesn't You're, happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the other thing and the flip side of this is I have had, I had a really cool dude. I have no idea who he is. Um, I appreciate him for what he did. I had I was working a double overnight into the morning shift, which is the worst kind because you just work from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Which is we do eight-hour shifts here, and then I'm now working 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. and that is a terrible shift yeah. or a ter- terrible double. Right, morning to night's good. Night. Uh, or morning to evening is good. Evening to night is good, but night to morning is God awful. And it was like 10 in the morning and I was exhausted. 
Um, well, I guess that's kind of a good lead in for um, kind of my next subject, but um, kind of one of my passions, especially with this podcast is talking about mental health. So, um, you know, I've talked very openly about all the issues. I don't, I, I, I hate to say like all the issues that I've had, but you know, I've seen some bad stuff and, you know, I'm sure you have as well. I know you have as well. Um, I have my own, own ways of dealing with, you know, the stuff that I see and, you know, kind of my way of releasing some of that stress and some of that, um, you know, built up, you know, emotional anxiety or whatever. Um, I mean, I know you work out, I need to get back into the CrossFit gym, but no, I'm, yeah. just <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Whiskey. The funny thing is I actually don't, um, uh, there's been so many times where I'm like, man, I need to go home and I need a drink. And I'll tell you what, that's usually not it. I'll say that, but I won't do it. But anyways, yeah. I'll let's continue your question though. So no, you're good. I didn't really have a question. I just, I just kind of okay. curious as to how you deal with, um, you know, in the past, some of the stuff that you've seen and, and, <laughs> okay so i i do lift um and are you sure <laughs> you're getting a little small there i don't know it's just a gut <laughs> <laughs> um i i've been so i've been a, a lifter since 2009 um i got out of the marines which is funny because i got out of the marines and did it when i was in the marines i was a runner um when I got out, you wouldn't believe that now. You've seen me at the CrossFit gym. I a sucking wind of five seconds into a workout. Well, I met you back at uh, CrossFit Bartlesville back when you were. That's right, guy. you did. I forgot that was uh, forty pounds lighter. Um, <laughs> I I have been doing. I, I did CrossFit from like 2009 to 2015. I became a cop, started powerlifting, gained a bunch of size. Now I'm like trying to get back to to a little bit less weight and breathing more but that was that was the thing though lifting has been a constant in my life for a long time now and uh it, it is it is a stress relief uh, so here's the thing for me and this happened in the so i did something really good for myself in the military and didn't even know I, know that i was really helping my mental health I did not get so sucked into the fraternity of the Marine Corps that every waking minute was spent with them. I was lucky enough to be two hours from home. I got stationed in 29 Palms. Uh, <laughs> I was I was in, a, in an outstanding battalion, uh, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines. And uh, man, hell of a battalion. Amazing people, some of the, some of the best I'll ever know. Um, but I live two hours from home, and every weekend, well, not every weekend, most weekends, I would drive home. I would spend time with people who were not Marines, my friends from high school, some new friends that I met through those friends, friends from church, friends from whatever. Whatever I knew him from, I was, I knew a lot of people. I'm an extrovert. I go and I meet people. That's how I recharge. I do need to have my time alone, but I mean, like really, I, I, I like meeting new people. So I would go back and I'd hang out with all these different types of people. And I think it kept me kind of balanced. Um, as a cop, I spend time with people at the gym. I spend time with people I've not met elsewhere. Um, I, but the thing is, is at the same time, while I say that I also maintain the relationships. So the Marines, I'd hang out with those. I still would hang out with those guys. I spend a lot of time with them. I love those guys. Uh, and the people, the people I work with at the PD, I love those guys to death and the girls they're, they're all fantastic people. Um, I get along with them really well and I try and spend some, I try and spend time with those people um, it, just as much as I try and spend time with civilians, you know, it's like, I don't want, I don't want my life to be just sucked into one group of people. Cause the thing is one thing that messes with a lot of cops minds, and this isn't just people that I, that I know here, it's 
you know, stuff that my, some close friends of my dad used to talk to him about. You're dealing with bad people on a regular basis. Two, three years into this job, I had to kind of remind myself like, hey, it's not that the world just sucks all the time. I'm dealing with the same revolving door of, you know, what, a thousand criminals. I have, so we have, we have 22 square mile town. We have 36 to 40,000 people here. In that group, most of those people are good people. We have a really good town. Well, you don't usually see those good people, though. I don't. I have to deal with the people who are problems all the time. And so, you know, occasionally I get one or two mixed in there where it's just like they had a bad day. But for the most part, I'm dealing with criminals. The same people doing the same crimes over and over and over again in new ways or the same old ways. And I have to, you know, I have to deal with that so regularly that it seems like that's all that's out there. So if you spend time with people outside of that realm, it's not the same cops all the time. Then you start seeing like, hey, this person is a nice person and they have a whole host of friends who are good people. Hey, look at we have Conoco Phillips in this town in Phillips 66. My wife, one of the nicest people you will ever meet. She has some wonderful friends. And I love them to death also. Like there are so many good people that you can really see a lot of good in. And if you don't, if you don't take time to explore those other relationships, you will, you will get inevitably sucked into a group that is, uh, let's, let's face it, we're, we're cops, we're medics, we're, we're, um, we're military firefighters we see so much dark shit that we have tons of dark humor go talk to people who don't have dark humor joke around with them understand that them not liking dark humor is not wrong and understand also that people who do like dark humor not wrong personally i feel like there's a line (laughs) i've heard some shit that i was just like man i love dark humor and i went to a dark humor page and i'm like Oh my God. <laughs> oh, that's dark. That's what really that's, dark is. That's, that is too far. Um, everybody's got too far. And I think you should be careful with that kind of thing. You should pay attention to what, who you're talking to, but dark humor is not a bad thing. Um, and neither is, neither is people who can't take it. Um, it's, it's not their fault. It's just, it's what they're okay with and what they're not okay with. But that, I think, has kept me grounded um, in a lot of ways. I can hear about what people are going through, horrible things people are going through. And I I feel pain for them, right? I, it, it hurts me to hear that they go through that. But I can hear it and not put it in. I put it on me to have felt like that that I did it. You know, it's just like, I just, I know that happened and I, I, I feel for you, but that's not what happened to me. So I'm here to make sure that you're okay. Um, like I said, the, the first time that anything ever really kind of got to me was the first time I actually had to look at child porn. Um, it was that, that case, that, that one kind of rattled me. Cause I was just like, I was just so unprepared. And again, how do you prepare for that? But yeah, but, it's not something that you, you know, but not everybody can you would think of. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have kids? Uh, not that I know of yet. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> no, um, I know. Dark so, I have, so I have um, one of my friends, and I'm not going to say who it was, but one of my friends saw part of one of my interviews when the guy was in the middle of confessing. And I'll go with the public record side of it. Um, I had a suspect who I got a full confession for him admitting to raping and molesting an eight year old autistic boy. And I, he and his girlfriend went down for this one. Now I'm again, I'm not going to go into details on it. Cause that, that part is not public record. Um, but he was, he, he was sitting there and he's got kids. He can't, he can't watch that stuff. You know, and, and some people have kids and they can see that stuff and it's, they're totally fine, but not everybody can. And so, yeah, he, we don't set him up for failure. We, we would never put him in a role where he had to go talk to somebody like that because I can sit there and be like, hey, man, 
I completely understand. No, I don't. <laughs> like, I don't understand why you thought yeah, that was I mean, okay. I don't know what you, but thank like you for what you do, I know you don't like hearing that, but there's not many people that could do what you do specifically and do it as well as you and do it, you know, and not let it, you know, affect their daily life. And yeah, and it's just one of those things where I'm, I'm lucky. I don't know why. I don't know if it's my upbringing. I don't know if I just, if I messed up in the head. And so that is, you know, it's not like I don't care. I just, it doesn't mess with me as much. Um, so, and, the, and the, the good side of that is since I love doing this, I feel like I could do it for a long time and be effective at it and maybe take it pretty far. Um, I mean, yeah, we need people like you. We need more people like you, so. Well, and what, and that's why, and this isn't, I haven't really kept this as a secret or anything. Um, you know, I've, I've applied for OSBI. I, I hope I can get it, but I, I want a longer reach. I want to, I want to hit more cases that are going to really mess with the, the really severe criminals. Um, uh, and I, I want to throw them in prison. So do you feel, I mean, like you were, how long were you on the streets for? Uh, I was on the streets for six six years um just shy so january of 2021 i got so october i got promoted to corporal i lateral transferred to detectives on uh january 4th last year um and then i started doing this in april april may something like that i think it was april so do you feel like I'll just I'll just say mental health just because it makes it easy with conversation. But do you feel like your mental health has had to change or adapt based on the change of position that you've had? I mean, going from the streets to, you know, it actually was good for mine. I feel like it was good for mine. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, man. I, I've done that a few times. No, you're times good. No, no, you're good, man. Um, I felt like there were good changes for me. So here's one of the things that I I feel for guys on the street because sometimes it's awkward being a street cop when you walk up to somebody and then you have to, and you're trying to like deter crime. Right. And you have to stop somebody and talk to them and you don't really have anything legally binding to hold them there. It gets really awkward when they're like, do I have to stay here? I'm like, no, but I would like to talk to you if you wouldn't mind. Like, (laughs) like what did I do wrong? Absolutely nothing. Well, why do I have to say here? Just because I'm trying to do my job. Well, especially with all the social <laughs> media like all the shit right warrant. now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, all the knowledge well, exactly. that people have. Yeah. Right. If, if somebody's, if, if it's 2 a.m., right? You've heard the saying, nothing good happens after 2 a.m. If it's 2 a.m. and you're walking down a residential neighborhood and dressed in all black or dressed in dark clothing. Hey, they're just minding their own up. business, okay? I'm fucking curious. <laughs> Like, why are you out at two o'clock dressed in dark clothes with a backpack on? What are you doing? D- like, d- you may have a perfectly ra- rational explanation, but understand that I'm still curious, and it's that's the, the nature norm. of the job. Yeah. So here, here's here's a here's a fun one that people struggle to talk about because it's hard to it's hard to say without rubbing somebody the wrong way. Criminal profiling. People freak out when they hear racial profiling and you should, if somebody is racially profiling, right? You don't, you do not do this stuff based on race, right? You do not do this stuff based on financial status. That's not how it works. Criminal profiling talks about the behavioral behavioralism of what's going on. Like the person dressed in dark clothes at 2 AM with a backpack on going through an alleyway. Right. What the fuck are you doing? Right. That's a genuine question. Like, what are you doing? And if you have a good answer for me, cool. And and honestly, it could be fair. If you choose not to talk to me and I have no legal reason to stop you, like, or to force you to stop, then you tell me to kick rocks. Okay. I'll I'll see you later. I, you know, I, okay. That happens. I have had people who said where I'm like, Hey man, can I talk for a second? Like, no, fuck off. And I'm like, all right, well, fuck you okay. too. Okay. <laughs> like, I, I, okay. You know, I'm, I'm still going to abide by the constitution, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to try and talk to you. 
if you are doing so, and because uh, to continue on with the criminal profiling thing, you know, um, okay. If I, I've, I had another one where I was, I was blacked out in my vehicle. I had my, my lights off and I was looking for a suspect. Coincidentally, this person had nothing to do with what I was doing, but they were also blacked out driving through this neighborhood. I'm like, motherfucker, I can do this. You can't turn my lights on. And he tried to run. And then all of a sudden, right before he pulled over, I saw a gun fly out the window. Yeah. There's, there's a fucking reason that I stopped that car. Not a coincidence. I found, I found a violation for the street and I pulled the car over and lo and behold, I got crimes out of it and I put people in jail. There's a reason that we have criminal profiling. If you are behaving in a manner that is consistent with criminal activity, expect right. to be stopped. Well, that's, that's, that's fair. fair. That's, that's just good that's, police work. Yeah, that's, that, that's what you're trained to do, right? Is, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're, you don't wait for it, crimes to happen. Right. It's proactive policing. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you are abiding by the Constitution, you're ab- abiding by case law, you are abiding by your state's laws, um, if you are acting within your capacity in a correct and in, 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 um, with integrity and really that's what if you're doing all that, you have nothing to worry about. Um, I, I will not I will not violate somebody's rights not intentionally. I did it once and I got in trouble for it. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I just I didn't know the law well enough. And I it was a civil matter and I thought it was a criminal matter. You know, I got I got spanked for that one. So. All right. Well, I won't do that again. It, it shit happens. But yeah, I mean, I was, I was, a, I was a new officer, and I just misread the situation. And I mean, if I, and the funny thing is, is if I was to explain it right now, guarantee you, most people would be like, "No, you were right." And I'm like, "No, here's where I was wrong. This one little thing." And but that's how, that's how easy it can mess up. But like for the most part, we're not out here trying to do something to mess with people. No, we're trying to stop crimes from happening. So if you do something. That makes me raise my eyebrow. Like, why? Why is that? I'm going to find out. But what I was getting at with that is what I liked about coming off of the street is the awkward interaction of, I have no reason to hold you here, changed when I became a detective. Because now, if I find you on the street, it's probably because I'm looking for you. And right. now I do have a reason to stop you. And you do not have any, any, anything within you that is allowed to stop me from doing that, except for trying to run. And if you do, then congratulations. You just gave me a good day because that's where most of us want to happen. Like, oh, yeah, cool. I get to go chase somebody. To well, yeah, say, and that's not to say... always dangerous. You know, I don't want I again, yeah, I don't want to, I, I you know, I, I hope it just ends with me tackling you and putting you in handcuffs. You know, but if if you, yeah, it's still fun to chase criminals. So, um, if if I'm, that's the beauty though of, of my job now is if I show up, if it's me, I'm a detective. I'm probably here for you, and I have a reason. You've probably committed a crime. I probably have a legal reason to stop you. Reasonable suspicion, probable cause, what have you. And I'm going to pull you in for questioning. Yeah, or we can just go to jail. So that's what I'm the one thing I do love about being a detective is I have a reason every time now. Um, and so I kind of takes that out of it. But you don't feel that the the situations that you now deal with more regularly haven't affected, you know, your mental health in any way. I have been doing this for less than a year. This specific this specific type of investigation right so i mean but you already said average, you had what, 40 cases in that two months whatever it was on average a detective will at our department around three years they're going to try and rotate you out if you haven't moved already is that just protocol or is that like that's kind of an unspoken rule it's like if you've been in here for three years we're probably going to move you into something else um and it's a good move. Mess. It is. Yeah, I, I, I don't like, I wouldn't want to leave what I'm doing, but at the same time, I get it, you know, and, and not everybody is me. There's stuff that I do not like doing as a cop that other people love. Um, and honestly, 
because I want to continue doing this, that's kind of why I, the whole OSBI thing. If uh, I, I hope it works out. If it doesn't, I'm, I love my department and I love working here. Um, I love what I do. I And I love being on the street. So if I go back to the street, great. But did, if did I go to OSBI, for this position? what was that? Did you apply for this position or did you get, did you get rotated into this? Uh, I asked for it. So I knew the guy was leaving that he was leaving that position to go to a different po point of, he was going to investigate something different. Okay. And so I went with him on one and I arrested a, a pedophile and, and I smelled blood in the water at that point. I was like, man, this is <laughs> fun. There's nobody else I'd rather throw in jail than a rapist or a pedophile. Yeah, I get so, it. That it makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been it's been interesting. I mean, I've had one that tried to flee to Iowa. Uh, I was able to track him down and with a multi agency approach, and we ended up finding him. Guy was hiding in the pig feed of a of a uh, of this like weird. I don't even know what the hell it was, but it was it was awesome. Like I was working with the I was working with deputies up in Iowa. Um, I've had another one who's, um, he tried to, he tried to leave the state. Uh, so I had Colorado where he was going to be flying to, like I had CBP agents up there getting stuff spun up to go pick him up there until I found out he hadn't flew, flew out yet. So I arrested him in the Tulsa airport. So can you um, cross state and county lines? Well, so here's the thing, right? Is I had, I had probable cause for a felony. Um, and so the, the Iowa one. I had a $250,000 bond um, and the warrant was already drawn up. So I was able to tell them, Hey, I have, I have a problem or I have a warrant for this subject for what was it? Six counts of, uh, of lewd, lewd acts with a minor. Jeez. Um, and so they were, they, they were all on it. They're like, Oh, hell yeah, let's go get them. Um, but like the Colorado one, I had probable cause because it was that day that I found out it's the day that it happened. And so, and it was a federal case because there was, there was a native involved. And so I worked with the FBI and the FBI went with me to the airport. Um, and not only that, um, I got a hold of the airport police. So all of us, it was actually kind of cool. We went on the tarmac. Wow. We went on, I went in through their office. We went on the tarmac and then went up to the terminals that way. Nice. Um, and I was hoping you say you like you're in your police car and you like the plane was taken off and you pulled up in your police car next to the plane and i am not Tom <laughs> <laughs> uh, but be cool though. but it, it was hey i'll tell you what it was awesome arresting somebody in the like with an entourage in the airport i mean yeah. like that was like a bucket list item i didn't even know i had I'm like what the hell this is so <laughs> cool <laughs> that's awesome yeah, so but um yeah, yeah, this God, this is such a cool job. I, I I love it. It's awesome, man. I uh I feel the same about what I do. I mean, especially now. I mean, not that I didn't you have a fantastic it is that is such a cool I'm so excited for you, man. Um, um I'm pretty pumped about it. I mean, not that I didn't enjoy what I was doing, you know, on an ambulance, but just like what I'm doing of a whole different yeah, I mean it's it's a level up and it's 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 you know, we're not seeing I'm not seeing the guy that stubbed his toe a week ago and you know, calls me at three in the morning when there's four cars in the driveway and there's six people that live there that all have driver's license. And he calls me to give him an expensive taxi ride to the hospital. And yeah, oh, have you taken anything yet? Tylenol? No, no. I mean, I'm taking sick people, right? Which I mean, uh, I get to do my job, what I've trained to do. So it's, it's pretty cool, but dude, I give full props. To, so fire and EMS are, I thought about, my options, right? And there's been numerous times during this job where I'm like, I wonder what it's like to be a mess, or I wonder what it's like to to be on the fire. And I'm like, man, I I think you'd be good. It's just, yeah, I don't. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I, I uh, hey man, I gave myself an IV once. That was cool. There you uh, go. But uh, yeah, that's not my thing. I, 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 I just. No. <laughs> what about it? I can see it all day. I don't care if I'm looking at it. It's it's when I have to touch it. If it's like if somebody is like <laughs> broken and, and something like I don't want to hurt you more. 
Like, and whereas, like, all of a sudden EMS shows up and they're just like, ah, quit being a bitch and throw them on the fucking green. <laughs> but, like, I don't get me wrong. I know that you, I, I know that EMS is really good at what they do and they're not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. They're sensible. But, like, you know, it's like, it's one of those, like, I just, I look at what EMS does. I look at what the hospital does. I mean, I, I, I love the people at the hospital. I've, I've, when I was on the street, I saw them plenty because of EDOs and stuff like that. I've spent a lot of time in there with those. There's some amazing people that work in the ER. Um, the people on EMS. Those that don't know what's an EDO. Oh, sorry. Emergency detention order. And that's actually a, a blanketed term. So emergency detention order is something specific. And that's usually when we have to, like, you are actually detained. We're taking you somewhere, whether you want to or not. Whereas there's also voluntary transports. Now that has since changed a little bit. Yeah. Um, so we are now Grand Lake is no starting longer. To... Well, yeah, Grand Lake. We don't like before we used to take them to mental health facilities or whatever. And yeah. we no longer do that. So, yeah. So that's been changing lately and that's for the better because I mean, ultimately you're putting, you're putting cops in a position where they really kind of shouldn't be. And I guess EMS, I didn't, um, that's well, one I just don't know about. And so it's, 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 I mean, for us, it's, it's just resources. I mean, you're taking an ambulance out of service for something that. Yeah. We got an airport where the plane crashes. Right. I mean, I mean it's, <laughs> it's something that we need people are trained to do in mental health. Not that we're not trained to do that, but. I mean, that's what they do. So, I mean, they come and pick them up and. And EMS here, if I'm not mistaken, EMS is like, this is countywide for you guys, right? You guys. Yeah. So we, I mean, we cover the whole, so we go to like Ramona, we go to Copan, we do intercepts with Caney. I mean, we go to. Juan. I mean, yeah. Oh, it's. And we've only got. So five out of the seven days, we only have three medic trucks. Plus we're doing transfers to tulsa and oklahoma city i mean oklahoma city transfer for us that's a six hour yeah. round trip and so yeah. that's at least two medic units in the whole county so yeah and, it, and, and that's and i too. think people don't understand that like there's a lot of people who i'm like you put yourself out in the county you expect you're gonna have to wait a minute like even with like a fire i mean you have a fire happen you probably don't have a fire hydrant near your house if yeah. you're getting a volunteer department, which they're great at what they do, but they're having, they leave their eight to five job when they can go to the station, grab the fire truck, and then they have to wait for more personnel. And then they have to come. I mean, it's just a, if you're, if you live in the County, you need to be self-aware and very prepared for situations that might come up. So but that's where, that's where the helicopter comes into play too. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the first time I ever heard somebody call for life flight, um, which, uh, I mean, it was a car accident. It's Aravac. Aravac. Sorry, I, I just go off of no, the you're good, you're good. common term. That's all right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know all this, that, that, all that specific <laughs> stuff. Um, no, but they they called for Aravac. Um, there you go. There you go. But it, was a, it was a car accident, and actually it was a piece of shit left his freaking wife to die. Um, crashed and then went home, took a shower. Absolute Jeez. garbage individual. Um, and I, you know what? If he's <laughs> tell you what, if you're watching, fuck you. Uh, anyway, the, <laughs> but no, it was it was it was sad because like, I mean she was covering for him too, but it was like, and they got canceled before they got there because she passed away, and uh, it was heartbreaking. It really was. It was sad. Um, yeah. But man, it's it's always. Everybody, everybody is the same. If they hear like, if they hear life, like, and I know that you, that's what we're going to end up saying is life. Like it's fine. It's fine. Is, if we hear that everybody kind of perks up like, Oh shit. Like shit just got real. This is not like something that can just be, can wait for a drive to the hot. Like they need to be flown probably to Tulsa. This is bad. So man, it's, it's a uh, kudos to you because you're dealing with commonly, uh horrific stuff like i mean that's going to be a lot more often for you and yeah so man that's that's not easy well but i love what i do and i it's it's exciting that i actually get to do a lot of the stuff that i've you know learned about and trained about but don't really get you know a lot of exposure to mm -hmm. on an ambulance so i'm excited appreciate it i'm good um 
So, I mean, the, kind of the last thing that, that, I mean, I don't know how long you want to do this. So I'm sure we could do this for hours, but <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of the last thing that I really have for a, a question is um, it's about peer support. Um, mm -hmm. What is, when I say peer support, when it comes to first responders, what's that mean to you? Stop the fucking rivalry. Now, don't get me wrong. You, it, a goofy rivalry, just have fun is one thing. But um, one of the most petty and bullshit, the biggest bullshit moments that I've ever seen is when I, I had a cop and a firefighter that were pissed off at each other. And it started to bleed over into other uh, them treating other cops like shit. If you got a problem with one other person, you handle your business with that person. There's nobody else doing our jobs where we are out there. I mean, EMS is starting to have to wear uh, vests. Fire is showing up where they're, where the, I mean, there's videos of firefighters having to fight people. We go and, to house fires and there's people that light a house on fire and then wait across the street with yeah. the fucking sniper rifles mm -hmm. and they start we, picking us off. Uh, okay. Yeah. I didn't even know about that. Like, I mean, but that's the thing is like, fuck. And so I have always, and it's always blown my mind, right? Because when I first became a cop, right? I don't get starstruck by like, anybody over there. I am looking in awe at all these other officers, firefighters, EMS. Hey, look how awesome these guys are. Getting out here and, and going into a dangerous situation. And like for me, I'm a cop. My job is to, in that situation is to be whatever support you guys need, right? If you need help, I'm going to show up and I'm going to make sure that nobody is anywhere near you. If, if a road needs to just get blocked off because people keep trying to drive over a water hose, I'm going to get there. I'm going to drop. I'm going to, I'm going to fucking scream my brains out at somebody who tries to pass my roadblock. Fuck you. Go around, find another way. I am obviously blocking this road for a reason. Go somewhere else. I don't care about how you feel. They're busy. All right. So when it comes to peer support, nobody is going to have your back the way that first responders are going to have each other's backs. Right. It's the same. And, and it goes with the military. You know, it goes with, you know, with other branches. We banter all the freaking time. But you know what? I have a really good friend in the Air Force. Really good friend. He's a fucking awesome guy. And you know what? He deserves just as much respect as any Marine, as any, as any uh, soldier, any, uh, eh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what it comes down to, right? We, we joke yeah. around all the time, but when it comes down to it, when somebody wants to get in there or when it comes down to us, we're all veterans now, right? We're all the same fucking person. Now we are all making, our lives better for each other by being there for each other. I can't train. I can't stress that enough for this job. If you are, if you are a cop, don't look at the firefighters as a rivalry for anything more than the joke that that is. Yes. Banter back and forth. It is fun, healthy banter. It's good. But at the end of the day, I, I, I love every single one of these firefighters that are out here. I, I am. I joke with them all the time. I love seeing them. Uh, same thing goes for EMS. Every time I see them, I'm just like, I'm so happy to see these guys, you know? Um, well, and, usually because they're like, hey, get this, get this drunk guy away from me. He's <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. And, and honestly, that <laughs> it's fun, <laughs> but like, but, but really when it comes down to it, man, that is, the, that is a fun part of this job is, is, is being able to be there for you guys. And, um, and, and I hope it's the same. I hope they're happy to see me too. Oh dude. I, I think it's, mm -hmm. we're, we're pretty lucky when it comes to Bartlesville, when mm -hmm. it comes to our first responders and even the surrounding, you know, Washington County and the God, you know, great guys. OHP, um, the volunteer fire departments. I mean, it, it, we are very lucky with, the the people that we have i mean when we Washington need you guys County emergency services yeah yeah i mean dude, when we need you guys we call you and we we know that you're going to show up and do whatever we need you to do and the, and the same goes for when you call us i mean we know that you're calling us for a reason mm -hmm. and we'll do whatever you guys need us to do and and 
like I said, I think we're we're pretty lucky with where we work and the people that we have, you know, at our disposal. Yeah. So absolutely. And and uh and and I can't and again I can't stress enough, like that extends to the hospital. Like and I and I hope that the, if any of them are watching this, they feel the same way. They, yes, they thank know. you for bringing that up because we we leave them out a lot. I'm not trying to interrupt you, but you said that yeah. and I think that's awesome and important because I mean I, I think of them as first responders. I mean, mm-hmm. just as much as we are. I mean, because we, you know, and even more so than than us on the ambulance sometimes, because we get to bring those people and drop them off, and we're like, all right, see you later. They're the ones that then have to deal with them for you know, it could be twelve hours, and then they could come back the next day, and that same patient could be still there. I mean, especially with the current situation with COVID and all the rooms and the staff, but yeah thank you for bringing that up but yeah, yeah. sorry no, I, i'll there. tell you what the times that i have been there um god they've they've always treated me so well and um they're awesome and, and i'm always happy to see them you know even the ones i don't know it's still it's always it's always fun to meet them and everything they've always they've always just been great um and the stuff that they have to go through i i i've said this a number of times i i no nope can't do it. No, nope. that, and that, you know, people say the same thing for cops, you know, like I couldn't do what you do. I'm like, that's fine. There's shit that I can't do either. And that, and I'll tell you what, the medical right stuff, yeah, medical stuff is one of them. This stuff is not, is not easy for everyone. I, I used to, when I first became a cop, I'm like, yeah, it, it made sense to me, right? This is what I meant to do. And so for me, it was just like, yeah, sure. You could probably do this too. The more I do this job, I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, you can't. <laughs> like for, for the people who are not meant to do it. And when you can tell, I'm like, no, you fucking can't go find something so, else to do. Do smells no. get you? No. Um, smells are nasty, but I'm not the vomit kind type of person. I do not throw up easy. Um but uh you know i can see dead body it helped it, i actually i i had a uh, person die tonight i had to go um process that scene and there's just an unattended death which for those who don't know unattended death just means that they didn't die in the presence of a doctor therefore an investigation is required at least to make sure that it was a natural causes death um until a doctor and the medical examiner will sign off that that is not some kind of foul play right um basically though showed up and found out that, you know, this person had hit their head. And so, you know, I'm having to kind of like move their head around and kind of like massage the scalp to see if there's any kind of, you know, cuts or or because they, because they hit their head a couple, you know, like a week or two earlier. And so I feel there's like a bump or something like that. If something had been, you know, some kind of brain bleed, swelling, whatever. And, you know, that doesn't bother me. You know, there's there, but there are investigators who will not touch dead body. Like, no, Stump can come over and they can check on, on their, you know, whatever funeral home, which, Hey, there's another, there's another one that shows up for stuff for us. But, you know, it's like, you know, this, that stuff's not for everyone, but for me, I don't really, it doesn't bother me all that much. I mean, yeah, there's nasty ones out there. I was I just hear ones. Support stuff, but I was yeah. just, I was hoping I, you'd give me something so I could, I could uh, call you next time I had something to. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, and I don't want to get too much into that one because that's a sensitive topic for a lot of people. Cause you know, they may have recently lost a loved one or their loved one may have died in a very serious, horrible, tragic way. Um, or there was something disgusting about the scene yep. and I don't want to re-trigger that for people, but yeah, that's uh that, that, that doesn't bother me as much, but I, I, I <laughs> we got videos of some nasty houses that people have been in and watching officers. Just, Ugh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, we even have medics that can't do certain things because they we had one guy that, you know, we have to innovate people, you know, if, if oh. kind of code or whatever. Um, and you, I mean, you know, the person, but he doesn't work there anymore. But every time he would innovate somebody, he'd start dry heaving. And as a medic, I mean, we we innovate people all the time. And so yeah, every sure. time he, he'd go to innovate and he's like, huh? Huh? it was just. <laughs> It was the, yeah, it was, it was the, one of the funniest things you've ever seen, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. I won't say his name, but I'll <laughs> tell you after we're done here, but that sounds good. Um, but yeah. Anyway, back to the peer support stuff, man. I mean, I, I, I think kind of like, you know, what you're saying is, is nobody's going to understand 
-hmm. you know, especially when it comes to the mental health side of it, you know, nobody, I I can't go and I can go to like my wife and, and talk about stuff and vent about it. And, but this is where the difference between sympathizing and empathizing comes into play because they can sympathize with me, but they can't empathize because they've never seen that. They've never been through that, but you know, your, your buddy in the, in the, seat next to you in your police car, the the guy next to you in the fire truck and and the ambulance, whatever. And even like you're saying, cross agency, you know, the, the police officer that was on the same call that I was on, that's bugging me or veteran, veteran. whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's all, um, you know, we, we've been through that stuff and and we can empathize. And you know what, here's to, to, to capitalize on that. I've never seen, more and really better or better making up words now uh better <laughs> community support than i have in the veteran community and so here's where it got here's where it got interesting right there's people um other veterans friends of mine that i know that i that i that i'm close with that honestly i didn't really have that good of a relationship in the military with and if you want to look at the importance of your peer support, look at veterans. Because when we were in, we put up with each other's bullshit. We fought, you know, you'd say some shit, but then you'd also drink with these people. You'd have the best times of your life with. And then you get out. You all go your separate ways. And then 15 years later, Holy shit, this person just died. They committed suicide. And I will tell you that it is a shockwave through the community every fucking time it happens. The whole unit gets back together. Guys, check up on each other. Has anybody heard from this person? I know they were struggling. And the community, the network that suddenly occurs when we lose one of our own again, it just revamps right back up. And the sad part is, you know, we'll lose that sometimes. Until the next one happens. Um, sometimes we're really good. Now, my my unit, 2-7, we have some of the worst suicide rates. Um, I was So I was in from 05 to 09. Um, I went to Iraq in 07. I went to Afghan in 08. We lost 21 people in, uh, Iraq, in Afghanistan um, while we were there. It was a... Like in, in battle? Yeah. We okay. had... Uh, we had some, we had a high casualty and a high death rate and people saw some horrendous shit. Um, Iraq, there's a lot of stuff that happened there. Um, and the, honestly, the guys before me, the, the deployment before I got into the unit, they saw a lot of fucking shit. Um, and really, if you just track that back even further, all the way up to 2001, like, I mean, it was just bad, 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 bad deployments. In fact, after us, it was the first time that I actually, that where we were at had kind of cleared out the, the unit after us apparently didn't fire a single shot. Eventually that came back, but like, that was awesome. But like all of the stuff that we all went through, it didn't matter who you were when you're in the military, you grow up, you get past that stuff. The stuff that you hold on to, like I did a lot. There's a lot of ways I fucked up when I was in there. I was, I was a shit bag a couple times. And I held on to that for a long time. I was, you know, it was just stupid and uh, nobody cares. You know, at the end of the day, we are all we have. And a lot of that is translated over to the first responder. Be there for your fellow officers, be there for your fellow firemen, be there for your fellow EMS and hospital workers and cross agencies and cross uh respects do this you do that i mean you're you're creating an atmosphere that people want to be around you're making you are where the grass is greener at that point um so that if if hell that's one of the more important things about this job is if you want to have a career in this you need to, you need to work with people well so. and my biggest reason for wanting to start this was to make it to normalize it, right? Normalize talking about 
mental health and suicide. I mean, as, as you very well know, more firefighters, police officers, uh, EMS workers. I mean, and I apologize for forgetting the dispatchers because oh, there's God. no way. There's no I way. I'm so hell sorry to all my dispatcher friends. No, you guys it's, are it's, fucking amazing. And you have checked on me numerous times. Um, I'm going to shout out to Allie specifically because she will get on my ass is, if I fuck up. <laughs> Allie is, I mean, all, all them are. Leaving the dispatchers yeah. out. Oh, my God. Uh, no, it's, it, it, it's but, no, you're, you're good. Yeah. You're good. But, I mean, it, that we, we got to get those numbers down. I mean, mm-hmm. and the only way that's going to happen is if we normalize talking about it, um, bringing up these numbers. I mean, I think by January 4th, there were already five police officer suicides. And that's Mm -hmm. just that have been reported. I mean, the first four days of this new year, there were five police officers in the nation that had already committed suicide. Two of them were partners. And that's just the police side. And that's just the ones that are reported. I mean, the reason I got into the, the, the mental health side of it and the peer support um, and I've spoken about this before too, but my Lieutenant at, at my department in Lawrence committed suicide. And then less than a year later, the chief of our department committed suicide and we were, yeah. I mean, completely unprepared for, for what that brought to us. I mean, that just that alone affected us more than we would imagine. But then we started looking back at it and we're like, I mean, all of us are, fucked up in some way right just because we we don't deal with that stuff we're not taught how to deal with it you know they don't that i I was never told when i was starting the academy that hey you're gonna see the the worst thing that you're ever gonna imagine and you're gonna see it multiple times a day for the rest of your career yeah i mean some people are never gonna see this stuff even one time and then we see it multiple times a day and then on top of that we get practice you know, I can't bring my bullshit into the calls, right? You can't do, you, you, you have to put on a face, right? So every call we run, we get practice at hiding our emotions and practicing, um, faking that, you know, we're fine, right? Because we have to show up and we have to do our job and we have to do it well. Um, so we get practice on lying about our emotions. So it's, it's a culture change that we're dealing with. And yeah. Um, so that's kind of my, that's why I, I love doing this and getting people to talk and, and people sharing stories and I mean, who better to do it with than, than fellow first responders. So. Yeah, absolutely. And man, I was, that was one of the things you, you hit the nail on the head. Like you're, that's veteran suicide has gotten a huge spotlight on it, which is good. And that is absolutely right. And I think that that's, that's fantastic that that's happened um, because for something so horrendous. I've used that word a lot tonight. Um, but uh, okay. John this, says interesting. If you look at all his podcasts, sorry, John, I'm going to, I'm going to point you out. He says interesting a lot in his podcast. What a loser. Uh, Which, <laughs> all of it is interesting, but yes. Uh, sorry, John. I love you. No, buddy. But, uh, but he, but, but, but no, like there's a huge spotlight on it for the veteran community. And you don't hear about, it. about the first responder community. I have never seen, and, and I'm not saying it's not out there. I just haven't found anything. You got to see what you're looking at. So yeah, I may have come across it and not realized it, but like, there's not we're a whole lot responder. out there. We're going to see that stuff. I mean, it's the not, it's not responder. out there. Yeah. The first it responder. It is, but you got to look hard. Yeah. And you have to go out and out and look for it. Whereas, 22 a day is, I mean, if I say that, everybody knows what I'm talking about yep. because that number is concrete. It's there. Everybody knows it. And it's, and it's an absurd number. Um, yeah, it's astounding, but the first responder community needs that same spotlight because if this stuff is happening as rampant as it probably is, especially in this day and age, because I'll tell you something right now, it's not easy being a first responder these days because everybody is looking at you like it's your fault. When you're showing up to stuff that you've been called to, you are showing up at the last minute when somebody needs your help desperately 
you're showing up to things that you never thought that or nobody should ever have to see. Uh, yeah, Emotions guarantee survival guilt. Um, you know, uh, excuse me. Um, for flashbacks, um, just just. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to just rattle it off like I wish I could. But like that stuff is going to play into effect the same way it does just every other every other discipline. Um. But man, yeah, it's it's a great thing to bring up to uh, to shine the light on it. So I'm well, glad I mean, that's what you're into as far yeah. as like bringing bringing exposure. Well, and I don't, I, I'm not trying to get recognition for doing that. I just think it's important that's to not do point. because I know, but it's I don't know, it needs to happen. Yeah. So, so I mean, thank you for sharing everything that you shared, and um, I mean we're. At, we're at two hours right now. So. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if we were going to do a right there. For, but... Yeah. Um, well, I'm always going to kind of promo the foundation. So, um, you know, everybody go check out the website. We've got a Facebook page um, and all of our podcasts. So this will go live on YouTube as soon as we get it edited, probably tomorrow night. And then um, every Friday at eight o'clock, all these go live on all of the podcast websites. So your, you know, Apple podcast, Spotify, all that kind of stuff. Um, um, like I said, check out the website. We've got an awesome clothing line. That's really comfortable. It's kind of on the higher price end range, but it goes for a good cause. hundred percent of that clothing goes right to the foundation that we then use to purchase, um, anything that's going to save a life of a first responder or the community that they serve. So, it could be training. It could be peer support training. It could be tourniquets, blood, you know, the stop bleed kits, um, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, thanks everybody for watching. Um, Brett, thank you for sharing and, and talking to me. I'm sure we'll do this again. Um, anything else that you, pleasure. yeah, man. Um, I'm, I would love to do this again with you. I'm sure we could go another two hours. Um, have you seen the new challenge coins, by the way? I have not. I've been, kind of sucked into my own my own corner of work anything else you'd like to say or put out there or anything uh jeffrey epstein didn't kill himself <laughs> you, you would <laughs> you would say well, that. hey hey that's right up my alley too is it not <laughs> we can have our own conspiracy theory podcast at some point but i'm not going to comment on that one um well again man thanks for talking thanks for sharing I mean, Thanks you had some, some great points that, you know, I'd never even thought of. So I appreciate your time. Um, I know you don't like hearing it, but thank you for what you do. I couldn't do your job and you said you couldn't do mine. So the feeling is mutual. You're welcome for my service. <laughs> okay, there you go. Right no, back at you. What you do, bud. So. All right, man. Well, thanks again and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks everybody for watching. This podcast is hosted by the Project Tribute Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to aiding our first responders. Thank you for listening. For more information on our efforts, check us out at www.projecttribute.com. If you're a first responder that would like to share your story, contact us at projecttributefoundation at gmail.com. You can find us on various social media and podcast sites by searching the Project Tribute Foundation. 100% of donations are used to save lives while our retail store pays for any of our operational costs. Thank you again, and please be sure to like us, follow us, and share our foundation with your friends. Thank you, and have a great day. Said I couldn't have, get the team I got a vision for the things you ain't believe And here's the motto, hard work this over everything It's that comeback I'm calling plays, hit the past and the run back Yeah, I'm far ahead and got a run last But we ain't letting up, we never done that Ain't nowhere to hide You ain't gotta see me come and keep me on your mind Cause I be on the way